So when we left our story of David in the last episodes, we found him living in the land of Ziklag. Now, this was an area outside of Israel, officially under uh, Philistine rule. The local king, the governor of the Philistines in that region, he gifted the Ziklag area to David in a strategic move. That's what it was. It was a strategic move to neutralize David. That's what uh, Achish, this king, had in mind. He thought he would neutralize David, and so then he could focus the might of the Philistine army against the forces of Saul's army there in Israel next door. So unbeknownst to the king, to King Achish, David and his growing army were making consistent raids against the the enemies of Israel from within that region, from that region of Ziklag. He would wipe them out. He'd go out there on a raid, wipe out the enemies, uh, the enemies' camps, leaving no survivors to tell Achish what was happening. And this whole time, Achish believed this whole time that that David was attacking Israeli settlements. And he thought by doing that, David's turning himself, he's turning Israel against him, right? And David never, never actually did that. But it was enough to make his position somewhat secure while he's living there in Ziklag. Now, one thing to note, and this is significant for our next episode when we get into the, the establishment of David's kingdom, the, come, the kingdom come, if you will. Remember when the ch- children of Israel took the promised land? When they came out of Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, then they took the promised land, and they divided it up among the tribes, right? That's what the book of Numbers, largely what it covers there, how the the land was divided up. David was from the tribe of Judah, all right? Now, the land that belonged to the tribe of Judah included towns like Bethlehem, uh, Beersheba, Hebron, even Jerusalem. And even though the tribe of Judah and wider Israel didn't control all that land by this point in the history of the nation, they were familiar with it. So if you're looking at a a map of this ancient history and you see the land of Judah just to the west of it, you'll find Ziklag, where David and his men were, were, right? That's where he and his army lived and where they were growing at that time. So a lot of these raids that David and his army did during this time in Ziklag worked to the direct benefit of the tribe of Judah, David's tribe. And this is really important. Because Saul was kind of neglecting Judah by this time. If you, again, if you look at a map of most of the battles we know Saul fought and the lands he he defended, especially in the latter part of his reign, they're usually located in the northern part of the country, while Judah is in the south. A lot of scholars read the book of 1 and 2 Samuel, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, really like a political story. They notice how frequently you'll find stories kind of echoing each other. Saul did this, and then David did that, right? There's a, there's a political narrative being played out, being really being laid out, saying that each king was legitimate, but David surpassed Saul's doing. Saul killed his te- thousands, David his ten thousands, remember? So for the people in the land of Judah, this was particularly true at that time. In many ways, the, the elders, the, the constituents, the population of Judah, they kind of felt abandoned by Saul and by the wider Israelite nation and the confederation of tribes at this point. That's one of the reasons why later in the story, when David is finally made king, it's the people of Judah that declare him king long before any of the other tribes do so. So when David faces a coup in later years, and even when there's a, a civil war in Israel after David is dead, the nation will split north and south into the lands of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And my whole point is, to, to going into all this background, is that these divisions are already present. There's differing degrees, differing levels of loyalty already present here. And that's important for understanding how things play out in this story. Now, south of Judah, in that land yet to be conquered, by Israel or, or Judah, by any of the tribes, that's where the Amalekites are based. And remember, the Amalekites, these are the people that Saul failed to wipe out in spite of God's judgment on them and God's directive to King Saul. The Amalekites, they're often seen as this despised people group in the eyes of God within the Old Testament. During the, the travels of the Israelites during the days of Moses, the Amalekites were, were this group, this nation, this tribal confederation that would perform raids on the Israelites, but they would target, specifically target the weak, the elderly, those who lagged behind the caravan of the rest of the group, and they would take those stragglers out. Eventually, they did start penetrating into the greater caravan of the Israelites that were moving through these lands, and they they would, you know, unleash these raids, this harassment. But keep that in mind. Keep that idea of who these Amalekites are in the eyes of the Israelites as far as their their reputation, 
who these Amalekites are for their part in the story that we're getting into today. By the end of the book of 1 Samuel, we find King Saul and Israel prepping for this pivotal battle against the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are amassing their forces. They're preparing for really to, to deal a, a death blow kind of to, to Saul, to Israel. So David and his men, living under the patronage of Achish, they go to Achish's land. They're in the, among the Philistines where this army is, is amassing, right? And they're at the rear of this army, assembled with Achish, and at that point, as they're gathering there to march out with the Philistines into war, this war against the Israelites, some of the Philistine generals realize they're there and they're like, you got to be kidding me. We're going into battle with this guy. We're not going into battle with this guy. No telling what would have happened if this went forward. Maybe David would have fought against Saul's army. Maybe, maybe he would have opened up a surprise front against the Philistines in the heat of the battle. We'll never know because even though Achish is totally convinced that David will be loyal to him in that fight, the other leaders of the Philistines refuse. They, they're not going to have any of this. They, they refuse to let David and his army go into the fight with them. So as a result, David and his men, they're sent by Achis. They're sent back to Ziklag while the Philistines march out to this epic battle in or near the region of Jezreel. And we'll come back to that battle here in a minute. But when David and his army return to Ziklag, they find that these Amalekites from the south have carried out a surprise raid on their homes while they were away. In fact, aware of the huge battle that was about to unfold against the Philistines and, and the Israelites, the Amalekites, up to their old tac tactics again, they had seized the opportunity and they were making raids on a number of towns and settlements in this whole region at that very moment. They knew the areas would be undefended because all the men had gone off to war. So the Amalekites were making raids on a bunch of settlements, on a bunch of unguarded towns at this time. And David's camp at Ziklag was one of them, right? So the men of David's army, they're devastated when they enter the, the remains of their camp. It had been burned to the ground, looted by the Amalekites. Many of their wives and children of these men, even the mighty men, had been taken captive by the Amalekites likely to become slaves from that point. Included among that number are two of David's wives, right? Abigail, remember her? She's one of the wives that was kidnapped along with his children. They've all been taken by the Amalekites. And so there ensues this among the David and his men, among his army, a general freak out. Their homes are burned to the ground. Their, their wives and children have been kidnapped. And all because David had led them to march off into battle on the side of the enemies of Israel, the Philistines. And even while David's participating in that general freakout and mourning over the loss of his own wives and kids, he senses that the tone of everything is starting to shift. For a moment, it even feels, it, well, there's a sense of mutiny in the air. The, the men of the army begin to look at David, and there's a genuine feel that they might turn on him here, maybe even kill him in their rage for what's occurred right here. Now, this event is significant because it's one of the final great tests before David becomes king. He quickly moves out of his own posture of distress, of dismay, and he inquires of the Lord. Remember, he, he, he no longer relies simply on his instincts. He doesn't rely on what seems obvious, the obvious course of action here. He puts God at the top of his priorities. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. That's the New King James Version there. So they set off in hot pursuit. The Amalekites have, have a head start on them, and David and his men are moving so fast that partway through the journey, a third of his own army falls away. They can't go on any further. They're too worn out. So after meeting up with an Egyptian slave that the Amalekites had discarded, thinking he was too sick and was about to die himself, David and his army, they learn the exact whereabouts of the Amalekite party, right? This raiding party. And so they sneak up on their camp and find them reveling in the spoils that they've taken from the different towns and settlements that they raided over the last few days. And probably this camp was like a, a meeting place for all several different 
Am Amalekite raiding parties because there had been a lot of camps taken, a lot of cities and towns uh, attacked by the Amalekites that day or over that set of days. So David launches a surprise attack on the Amalekites and just decimates them for a full day and a half, just decimates them. They recover all, the, the, uh, David and his men, they recover all that the Amalekites had taken, not only from David and Ziklag, but from all the lands of Judah that they had attacked. Well, after the fighting, David and his men returned to Ziklag, and they re reunite with those 200 soldiers that were too tired and had to stay behind partway through the journey. And David insists that these guys be given the same prizes from the spoils of the battle as everyone else. Further, David figures out all that was not included among the, the spoils from the camp at Ziklag, and, or really what was included that went beyond what was taken from Ziklag, he, uh, among their spoils that they had taken from the Amalekites, and rather than keeping these prizes as his own spoils of war, he returns them to their rightful owners among the different towns, the cities throughout Judah. And once again, we see David cultivating his uh, relations with the leaders, with the elders of the towns and cities throughout Judah. Now, that's the final act of David in 1 Samuel. And although it's worth, worth mentioning for our story on the days of David, there were bigger happenings, bigger events unfolding elsewhere in the land at this time. While David's fight with the Amalekites is more like a, kind of like a background thing, a thing in the back, going on in the background to this story, the real event of the day, the real, the real issue, the hot, hot button thing in the news press that day was this fight coming to a head in Jezreel between the army of Israel under the leadership of Saul and the army of the Philistines. This is going to be a major battle. I mean, the, the Philistines hadn't put together this level of force against Saul, against Israel, for nearly a generation. And as Saul prepared to meet them in battle, he could see, it was pretty obvious, the battle was already against them. 1 Samuel 28, verse 5, it says, When Saul saw the vast Philistine army, he became frantic with fear. Beset with fear, on the verge of panic, Saul did what would have seemed logical for any king of Israel. He sought God's word on the matter. This is 28.6, says he asked the Lord what he should do, but the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Now, I don't know which prophets he's talking to here. There were no prophets that walked among Saul. Most likely, these were men who claimed the title of a prophet, but lacked the actual gifting or grace of a prophet. The, the sacred lots that it talks about in that verse that, those were these stones that people would throw to figure out what God's will was, kind of like throwing dice, something like that. The main point is, Saul couldn't hear or figure out what God wanted here. And we know why, right? God, God had cut him off. God's rejected Saul. Saul hasn't looked for the word of God for years. Why, in this moment of crisis, would God now begin to speak to him? Now, the story that follows here, it's, it's really one of the, the weird ones of the Old Testament, one of the weirdest stories in the Old Testament. And it's weird because there's a lot of different takes on this. Before I get to that, though, I need to, to set some context. A verse earlier in 1 Samuel 28, 3, it says this, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Now, a lot of the commentaries and ministers that I came across when researching for this episode, they suggest that Saul cleansed the land of witches and those who practiced witchcraft. That's what that verse is saying. This was, that was a command from God and the Torah, and, and Saul was obedient to that. That's what they believe happened here. In fact, when I've always read this passage in the past, that's what I assumed happened here. Saul, being faithful to the word of God, cleansed the land of witchcraft. But that doesn't really track when you think about it. This is a guy full of paranoia. He's murdered priests of God and their families. He's, he's unjustly chased David through the land. He's done all sorts of atrocities in the course of this story. At no point in his biography captured in, in uh, the book of 1 Samuel do we Saul doing, see Saul doing anything that suggests he's seeking God or seeking to obey God. Saul's a really worldly ruler with some real dark stains on his reign as king. So I don't think this cleansing of the lands of all who practice witchcraft had anything to do with Saul obeying the word of God. I think it had more to do with the death of Samuel. Once Samuel was gone, once he's dead and out of the way, Saul felt empowered to push against 
anyone who appealed to a higher invisible realm for guidance, for insight. That was the realm that rejected him, after all, that, that claimed the kingdom would be taken from him. So Saul wasn't obeying God here in this passage. He was making this weird effort to fight against God, to combat God. He's too ignorant of the things of God to recognize there was a big difference between witchcraft and those who, who practiced the dark arts of speaking to the dead from those who spoke to God as prophets. He just saw people who communed with the unseen realm, and he wanted them out of his land spiritually. And spirituality of any sort was outlawed under Saul. That's what's going on here. And because of that, now, when the time comes, when the occasion comes that Saul needed to hear from the spirit realm, even those who called themselves prophets, those who were planted around him, they weren't really prophetic. We know that because God didn't speak to them. When they ask God, what should, what's going to happen? What should we do? God doesn't give them a response. And clearly, there was some spiritual insight here. By the end of the story, we're going to get that. God, somebody tells them what's going on and what's going to happen, but nobody can hear anything within Saul's inner circle. So his fear growing to a state of panic, Saul desperately searches for a medium, a witch, someone who can talk to the dead for him. Now, this was a fairly common practice in the ancient world, among, uh, well, among pagan cultures it was. In the Babylonian story of the Epic of Gilgamesh and in the, uh, the Greek story about Odysseus, we come across these same type of witches or mediums. They lived near these pits dug into the earth and they claimed they could call up the dead to speak to people from these so-called ghost pits, right? That they, These pits that they dug. The medium would cast their spell, call up the dead, and their customer, the person seeking to talk to the dead, would hear the sound of birds chirping which the medium would then translate as the voice of the dead communicating from the underworld. Gilgamesh, in that story, the epic of Gilgamesh, he supposedly called up one of his friends using a ghost pit in the ancient Babylonian epic. Odysseus' story, it actually describes how to build a ghost pit, tells him the type of sacrifices to make, how to do this thing. The Bible even references this practice later on, and the prophets in the book of Isaiah, as the Israelites strayed from the path of God, they, they took up with different idols and, and necromancy, right? And, and God, when speaking of the judgment he would bring upon them, he says in Isaiah 29, 4, You shall be rot, or brought down, you shall speak out of the ground, your speech shall be low out of the dust, your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall be a whisper out of the dust. That's Isaiah 29, 4. That prophecy right there, it only makes sense if the Israelite people who Isaiah delivered it to were familiar with the practice of witchcraft that other parts of the ancient world participated in during this period of history. Modern archaeologists have found at least three structures which they believe to be these, uh, these ancient ghost pits there within Israel itself. The irony is that this sort of witchcraft and speaking or seeking of the dead was strictly forbidden in the Bible and in ancient Israel. It was something that the Philistines did, not something the Israelites did. So the witch of Endor that Saul goes to here in this story probably learned the practice from the Philistines at some point. So Saul is literally utilizing the beliefs of his enemies to try and find comfort and direction for his own soul. As for the witch herself, through the centuries, artists have taken a lot of liberty trying to describe, trying to paint her. We don't know a lot about the witch of Endor. Some Jewish traditions suggest that she was the mother of Saul's uncle and, and his leading general, Abner. But that's not actually stated in the Bible itself. Whatever the case, the witch herself was surprised by what happened here. And it didn't follow the patterns of other stories of ghost pits in the ancient world. This is 1 Samuel 28, verses 7 to 8. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. I'm just going to read this story here, right? This is, in, this is the rec recorded in 1 Samuel 28. And then after reading it, I want to pull it apart for some deeper considerations. This is verse 9 to 14. Then the woman said to him, Look, 
You know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you, what did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And he said, or, and she said, An old man coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he, stopped, he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. So, here we come. He's going so far as to communicate with the dead, or at least seeking to communicate with the dead. He's still not seeking God. He's going back to the man, Saul is, he's going back to the man that Saul knows could hear from God, Samuel himself. And that's kind of a telling reality all in itself. God's rejected Saul, and Saul has rejected God. He just wants something that will work and hopes perhaps Samuel can find some answers for him. When this spirit, this apparition, comes up out of the ghost pit, the woman, the witch of Endor, she freaks out. This isn't like the times in the past. Some people believe that she was just a con artist, that she used to, uh, she was used to just playing this game and pretending to speak to the dead through chirping birds to get money out of her customers. I don't really buy that. I think she was into some dark magic, just like the realm of light can open up to us through prayer, prayer and we can, we can seek the will and the word of God. The realm of darkness can open up and we can get into some nasty, some dangerous juju there. That's why the Bible forbids on several occasions from doing this type of thing, from messing with this stuff. But even at that, the witch of Endor is surprised by what she sees here. She doesn't know what Samuel looks like. It's not just the appearance of Samuel. There's something about this apparition that alerts her to the fact this time is different. Whatever came up out of that ghost pit informed her with enough insight to realize who her customer actually was. And she freaks out at the revelation until Saul calms her down. Notice that Saul doesn't see the apparition himself. He hears it. As we'll see in the next set of verses, he hears what, what the apparition says, but he doesn't actually see it for himself. The woman describes what she sees, and that's how he knows it's Samuel. And that's when Saul bows down. Now, the big, the, the most obvious question here is, was this really Samuel? Religious scholars through the centuries ha have debated this point. If Samuel was, was dead, shouldn't he be in heaven? Why, why does he say he's sleeping, right? And that's what he says to Saul in the next few verses. If he's not in heaven, then where is Samuel? What does that mean for everyone else who dies before the return of Christ? Some scholars have suggested that uh, it, it wasn't Samuel, but it was a demon disguised as Samuel. You know, Satan comes disguised as an angel of light sometimes. Thus, Saul bows down to a demon right here. Then he even follows his guidance given by the demon, which then leads to Saul's death. Ultimately, that's what happens here. Maybe that could be what this is. I don't really know. The witch sure thinks it's Samuel. The info Samuel gives Saul is sure accurate. If this was really Samuel, well, there's all sorts of questions about this disembodied soul. Why is he wearing a robe in the, after, in the afterlife, right? St. Augustine thought this was Samuel, but appearing in the same manner that Elijah and Moses did when they showed up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then there's a, a third school of thought that God actually sends Samuel to appear and talk through the seance performed by this witch of Endor. To be real honest, I don't have a definitive answer about what's going on in this passage. There's some definite confusions and problems with the scene that suggests this might not be a God-ordained designed event. When you dig into the details of what the apparition actually tells Saul, there are some minor discrepancies to it. Not least of all, that the apparition doesn't rebuke Saul for calling up the dead. That's something the Bible forbids. So why doesn't the apparition say anything about that? Because this is so far outside the bounds of what God's permitted, I don't really find this story as something we can take too much insight from as far as learning about the afterlife or, or the design of God. It'd be like figuring out worship by examining the practices and the stories of those who worshiped some of the false gods in the Old Testament. It's not really productive, not really effective. This is verse 20, or verses 15 to 20 in chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? 
And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by the prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for, the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell length, full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. I think the takeaway from this story is to see how darkened Saul has become by this point. Here on the night before this fateful battle with the Philistines, he's seeking out a conversation with the dead. The man who once was entrusted with the grace of God, with the authority over the children of God, has now entered into abject spiritual poverty and darkness. The closing of the story seems like a minor detail. Due to, due to his fear and, and panic, Saul hasn't eaten in days, so he's kind of extra weakened by this point. And he's lying there on the ground about to leave, and the witch of Endor makes him some bread, kills a calf for him to eat. But the stories of the ghost pit, when you research this from the ancient world, they tell about blood sacrifices that were made to the dead at these ghost pits. And what's most likely is that what she cooked for Saul here, what the witch of Endor made for him, was one of these meals for the dead. And that's what the scene closes with. The great leader of Israel, the first king of Israel, sitting with a witch and a feast to the dead, awaiting his inevitable fate. Well, the next day, the long-awaited battle between Israel and the, Fi the Philistines finally begins. And in short order, the Philistines indeed rout the armies of Saul, the armies of Israel. As the battle proves lost, Saul and his sons, the princes of Israel, set off in retreat, hard on the run to escape possible capture from the Philistines. This is the final chapter of 1 Samuel, and the tragedies begin to pile up right here. 1 Samuel 31, verses 1 to 2. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadad, Machishua, Saul's sons. The great honorable prince of Israel, David's friend, Jonathan, falls dead along with his brothers in this scene. Reading on, the battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore, therefore Saul took a sword and he fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. The great king of Israel, dead by suicide, fallen in battle. His life finally ended. But the fall and dishonor of Saul wasn't over. Next came the mutilation of not only his body, but the bodies of his sons, including Jonathan, at the hands of the Philistines. Verses 8 to 10 says this, So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Geboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths. That's false gods there. And they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Epic tragedy here. You can feel it when you read these words. As awful as it is, the literature is incredible. I compare this to something like the Iliad or, or the Odyssey or the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, both stories of ancient literature. But they come, in my mind, they come nowhere near this level of drama, of tragedy, as what 1 Samuel is describing here. Adding to this drama and connecting dots and points of the story that we would have otherwise have forgotten, our friends from Jabesh Gilead, return to the narrative. 
Remember them from an earlier episode? These were the ones that Saul first delivered when he became king of Israel. They were likely related to him due to their role following the civil war in Judges against the tribe of Benjamin that Saul hailed from. Well, in honor and memorial to the death of Saul, the men of Jabesh Gilead, they conduct a non-sanctioned rescue operation into the land of the Philistines. And they secure the, the bodies of Saul, of his sons, and they bring them back to Israel for proper burial, thus giving these guys a final death, a final conclusion to their story. Miles away from all of that, David is awaiting for word of the battle between the Philistines and Israel. Two days pass since his, his uh, counter raid on the Amalekites that we started off this episode with. And he and his men, they're still recuperating there in Ziklag. And David looks out upon the horizon and he sees a messenger approaching. They bring this messenger into the camp at Ziklag and David finds out what happened. The man's bedraggled. His clothes are torn. He's filthy. He's obviously been on the run. And 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 to 10 says this, And David said to them, Where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. Then David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered him, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people have fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? Then the young man who told him said, As, it, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Geboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? So I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was his, on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Now, the big news is, the headline, is that Saul and Jonathan are dead. That's the big news. But the subplot here is that this man, this messenger, is an Amalekite, probably part of the intelligence network in these lands that helped spread the word to the Amalekite raiding parties that had conducted so much chaos against the Israelites during the past week. He made up a lie of what happened to Saul and his own role in it, probably stealing the crown, the, the jewelry off the corpses of Saul and Jonathan. He probably thought David would reward him for this. After all, didn't everyone know that Saul tried to kill David? Well, David breaks down into tears, tearing his clothes at word of the deaths of Saul and Jonathan and the terrible defeat suffered by Israel. He and his men don't eat all day long as they mourn the news of what they've heard. Then, near the end of the day, David begins to regain his composure. And he looks over at the Amalekite messenger. And this is recorded in verses 13 to 16, chapter 1, 2 Samuel. Then David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered and said, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. So David said to him, How was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of the young men and said, Go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, Your blood is on your own head. So for your own, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Once again, knowing the background of the Amalekites, the background of what's preceded this moment between David and his men and the Amalekites gives a little more context to the response right there. Our episode closes today with the song that David crafted upon hearing of the death of Saul and Jonathan. Of course, it was originally presented in Hebrew when he first sang the, the song of the bow. That's what this is called so many centuries ago. Centuries later, though, during the age of the church and when the Bible was being restored so that man could read it, William Tyndale, this Englishman, He's the famous English translator of the Bible. When you, when you hear the story of Tyndale, most of us fail to grasp how influential his translation of the Bible into English, how influential it was to our daily life even today. Tyndale didn't just translate the Bible to English, but he captured the, he captured the English translation with a poetic genius. He coined phrases in that process that help us see the spirit behind the words of the Bible. 
It was William Tyndale who crafted phrases like the apple of his eye, a labor of love, a thorn in the flesh. He could, he could have taken these pictures and been very literal in his translation, but he instead translated them almost poetically, giving us images with his English words that helped us see the truth behind the verse that he translated. And he did all that even while refusing to compromise on the meanings of the actual test, text. One of those phrases is included in the Song of the Bow. It was Tyndale who coined the phrase, How the Mighty Have Fallen. This was his translation, or a second generation of his translation, that uh, was put into the Song of the Bow. And for me, when I read these words in the first chapter of 2 Samuel, that exquisite phrase captures the heart of David, the feelings of the nation of Israel in this dramatic, this tragic moment upon the death of Saul, upon the death of Jonathan, the sons of Saul, and the aftermath of their fall and the, the mutilation of their corpses by the Philistines, David crafts the song of the bow and it brings together a respect for the kingdom, the Israelite kingdom that's fallen, even while it shines a ray of hope into the future for what might lay ahead for them. I'm just going to read this as 2 Samuel the verses, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, the song of the bow. To close out the episode, a gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Geboa, may you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised. The shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life, they were loved and admired. And in death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished.